Let's start right at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about your family and your growing up. Uh, my family and growing up. Um, born in Chicago, raised in Chicago, lived there until <coughs> my early 20s. Uh, single, only child, raised by my father essentially because my mother was more or less absent due to <coughs> mental deficiencies, I'll say that. <laughs> Wasn't the most pleasant of childhoods with my mother. Um, but my dad walks on water, as far as I'm concerned, so he made up for it more ten times over. Um, so, born in Chicago, raised in the southern suburbs of Chicago, at some point moved back to the north side of Chicago until at some point I moved to New York. And what else would you like to know about the family life? Or the Anything you'd like to share? Um, I am the man I am today because of my father. He absolutely rocks. He accepted me gay. He accepted me kinky. He accepted me when I decided to not become a lawyer and become a dancer. That was quite a conversation. Um, he has always accepted me without question with maybe a few moments of silence <laughs> as he digested whatever it is he was supposed to digest. Uh, and. I say that not just because I'm the, I think I'm the man I am because of him, but I think I'm the kinky man I am because of him. Because I think his ethics and his morality and his sense of righteousness, which he always instilled in me, uh, was a really good foundation upon which to be kinky and alternative generally. So um, I credit him with an awful lot. You were living in Chicago at an interesting time. Please tell us a bit about the Chicago gay scene as you knew it when you were there. Um, so the time period is 1972. Uh, I had just gone off to college, which is about 100 miles south of Chicago, and I decided to go into the city, into Chicago, on a regular basis. So I drove that 100 miles, sometimes every weekend. And at one point, I started to frequent two bars in particular. One called the Glory Hole. It was the name. He claimed it was the gold mine name, not the whole name, but we know better. Uh, and the Gold Coast, one of the most famous leather bars ever. And my gay life started directly in the leather kink world. It, I came right out into it. It was either the sleazy side of gay life or the leather kink side, and sometimes they merged significantly. And uh, it was often romanticized. We know about the old guard stuff that we hear about a lot, much of which is romanticized and quite frankly mythologized. Uh, it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It really was. And I mean that in the best of sense. I don't mean that in the negative sense that will sometimes be portrayed. But um, we were out to have fun. There was a modicum of protocols here and there, but they were scattered. Um, it was uh, much more freeform than one would want to believe. We didn't use terms dom and sub. We didn't really use master and slave very much. We used top and bottom. And versatile, because most were still versatile. Back then. I contend most are today. Um, and the leather and kink life did not merge too much with the mainstream gay life in Chicago. And I loved to go out dancing. I was a disco kid. I really was. And I would go to the big disco bar, which was one block from the Gold Coast, the, le the main leather bar. I would dance till a certain hour. I'd run home, which is about 12 blocks away, change into something like this, and then I would be in the leather bar, and I would close my nights out in the leather bar, for obvious reasons, because that's where I got laid. And um, that was a large chunk of my life in my youth. Were, you, were there any surprises or anything that you found fascinating about the leather life at that time? I think my eyes were opened. I was at a bathhouse in Chicago. Oh, by the way, I was, I, I was bartending underage in the glory hole. That was a little point I didn't point out. Um, so I'm 18 years old. 
they had lowered the drinking age to from 21 to 19, and I got offered this job, said yes, it was a different era, we didn't check things so much back then. And so I was bartending there, I was also at some point, I was a backup bartender at the Gold Coast, because I worked for Chuck Renslow at another one of his bars, another story. And, um, but the glory hole, the owner said to me, uh, I said to him, oh, it's my birthday, wish me happy birthday. And he said, great, how old are you? I said, 19. <laughs> he just went white. And I said, well, I'm legal now. And he didn't fire me, and he liked me. And so, uh, so I was bartending in the gay bars, in the kind of sleazy gay bars in Chicago, underage. And uh, that was a great thing. <laughs> Well, you studied dance, and you were a professional dancer. Please tell us about that. I was. Uh, I always had an affinity for body movement. I was a competitive gymnast from the age of 8 to 19. Actually, 8, eight to 18, really. Um, 19, theoretically. Um, and I was in college. I was at the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. And I was an accounting major with a pre-law designation meant that I would become a CPA, eventually become an attorney. My corporate life would be set. Um, and my, after my first semester, I was there on a partial athletic scholarship. I was a jock. So gymnastics, which was not the big sports, but I was still a jock. And I was very disillusioned with college athletics. Uh, why are you taking cal calculus? Take something simpler. Why are you taking theoretical physics? Why don't you take something simpler? Why don't you, and they kept dumbing down my classes. And the coach kept forcing me to do that. And finally, I got very frustrated, and I quit. And to fill in the gap of physical activity, because I had quit the gymnastics team, physical all my life, I took a PE modern dance class. And the instructor pulled me over after the third class and said, why did you let go to here? <laughs> and I, and and I said, well, I've been a competitive gymnast all my life. I've coached women's gymnastics for four years, men's gymnastics for six. And he, she goes, oh, that's why. Would you like to be a dancer? And I said, I've never thought of that. And she said, have you ever thought of maybe auditioning for the dance department? No, let's give that a try. And so I auditioned for the dance department. And being a man, you have an advantage. Far more women in the business than men. And so I got in and called dad the next day, said, dad, I'm switching majors. Oh, son, what? Dance. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> and all he, through clenched teeth, he said, I love you and whatever it is you want to do in life, go do it. And that's really what he said. There was a long pause. It was a big adjustment for My dad is a big academic and corporate man. Um, and then I, very quickly thereafter, they, we had a guest instructor, came into the college, was teaching, said, you're pretty good, in fact, you're very good, do you want to dance professionally? I said, yes. She said, then get out of college, now, because two, two and a half more years, you're done. Because you're a man, you have an advantage, you can go do it. Moved back to the big city, study your butt off, start dancing right away. I did, and I danced professionally for about seven years. What were some of the productions you did? Uh, I did two modern company touring groups. I was with the Chicago Ballet for a little while. I uh, did a few bus and trucks, which in the business is when you do musicals and things like that, and they bus you around in tours. Um, Gypsy and a bunch of other things. Uh, I did a six-month gig at the Playboy Club and a nightclub act. Um, I did a lot of industrials for people in the business, a lot of commercial industrial films kind of thing. That was, uh, the typical actor, dancer, singer. Uh, I was uh, a, an, inc an incredibly good dancer. I was a really good actor, and I was a so-so singer. So I was never the soloist. Um, and I did that for seven years, and I loved it. When you were young, what did you do for extra cash? Ooh. <laughs> Um, I worked in an ice cream shop. I didn't actually have a job until I was 16. My dad had a rule that I never needed to work as long as I kept my grades up. And uh, he said, that's your job as my son is to prepare yourself and I'm here to back you when you go to school and do your thing. And at 16 I wanted a job, so I worked in an ice cream parlor. 
Then I worked in a truck that drove soft ice cream around to various places. Um, in my freshman year of college, I was an actor in psychological experiments where I was the control, and they would hire me for research, and uh, I was always the control. I would talk to 50 people this way and 50 people that way, and I would compare the results. Um, and I made quite a bit of money doing that, actually. Um, um, what else did I do? And then by the time I was 18, I was bartending. So uh, I didn't have a lot of jobs early, but that was, that was my early employment life. Let's take one step back a little bit and go back to your bar scenes. How did that impact you as far as fetishes, kinks, anything like that? What things were presented to you then? Well, I, I'm working in a bar called the Glory Hall. So, come on. It's, it was a sleazy neighborhood bar in Chicago. Everybody knew it was sleazy. It, was, it had a very butch aesthetic. Um, many would call it kind of a Levi leather bar. It wasn't a butch bar, or a leather bar, but it was a kind of a butch aesthetic bar. Very sleazy. Back then, there weren't a lot of alcohol and beverage control laws that people did much, and we paid off the cops, quite frankly. I slid many a bill under a drink to a police officer. And, um, and there was a lot of sex that would go on, and much of it I was in the middle of. Um, I was highly sexual from the time I was eight years old. So I've been highly sexual all my life, and I've been kinky since I was eight years old. I was t spanking the next door neighbor weekly for three years when I was eight, nine, and 10. Um, so it, this is, I used to tie boys to trees and do not so nice things like pull their pants down and run away and leave them alone and they thought they were alone and they weren't, but it was kind of mean, but it was fun. Um, and um, so the early gay bar life really impacted me from the beginning because the, the leather, butch aesthetic, edgier, highly sexual, kinkier aspect was what I was exposed to immediately. So, and I went, oh, I'm home. When I walked into the Gold Coast, I literally turned to my friend I was with and said, I'm home. That felt more natural to me to be in that space than any place I had been in my life prior to that. So, um, and then one other thing happened that I was very young, I was 18, I was in a bathhouse, I'm actually 18 I guess was legal then. So I'm in a bathhouse, man's country in Chicago, and I had just moved into the city. I'm bartending in this bar. I've sort of begun to explore my kinky self. And a guy walks out of the room at the bathhouse limping. And I went, oh, did you hurt yourself? And he goes, no. And his foot was covered in Crisco. And he had stuck his foot up some guy's butt. <laughs> and I went, whoa. OK. And I just said, you know, that may not be what I want to do right now, but I love the fact that this is going on. <laughs> and, and that just plugged into me right away that, okay, kinky is cool, because he talked about it like it was the most natural thing in the world. And that influenced me. So I, from a very early age, 18 on, kink was normalized for me. I didn't, I never lived closeted in any kind of closeted way. Um, all my corporate life, you name it, I've always been very out. And I think part of it was these initial men that I met who were so comfortable being out and kinky made me feel that way. So that was probably the best influence that that early life had. And then the Gold Coast was just Nirvana. It was just leather men, kinky men's Nirvana. Fill us in a little bit on that. We hear a lot about the Gold Coast, but very few people actually tell us what went on in it or what they experienced in it. When you walked into the Gold Coast, there were, the walls were covered with these amazing paintings by an artist named uh, ATN. That was his artist name, Dom Arhus. I'm saying it wrong, and I apologize on it. But what is it? I believe he, yeah, Arhus, he's correct. Um, I apologize for that. Um, brilliant artist, wonderful, lovely man, uh, and his art was this twisted, sick, in a wonderful way, paintings all over the bar. So the moment you walk in, that's what you saw. And it was, it set the tone. It really set the tone. And um, it was not as much leather as you might think. Lots of Levi, lots of Levi jackets. Lots, uh, there were leather jackets. 
not as much full leather garb. If somebody was in full leather garb, they stood out a little bit because we didn't have as many leather makers back then. And you didn't have it as standardized as it is today. Um, and we were also morphing into that butch aesthetic that we see today because it, it definitely had a, a, a history of evolving over time. And so we kind of went from Levi leather, which is what we used to call the leather bars, sort of. Levi leather, because Levi was the predominant garb. Um, and it was a sea of men. Uh, it, it was definitely men. I could count on one hand the number of women I saw in the Gold Coast in the entire time I was there. And by the way, I believe, and Chuck Renko will probably chastise me if I'm wrong, I think I'm correct, that the bar was actually in the name of a woman. Mm -hmm. yes. Who, am I correct? Yes. Was it, and, and, and Agnes. I can't remember her name. Agnes. Agnes, thank you. And so the Gold Coast was technically owned by a woman, which I thought was awesome. And, um, but it was a very gay male space. It definitely did not embrace effeminate men in any way. Um, I, I won't say it was nasty to effeminate men, but guys from the disco from two blocks away would come in and there was a definite, you don't really belong here. Um, but I never saw anybody really truly rude, but they would just gently let them know this is probably not your space. Um, there was a downstairs. You can imagine what uh, went on downstairs. Sex went on in bars back then all the time. <laughs> in Europe, it still happens. Almost every gay bar in Europe has a back room. And I see somebody from Europe shop shaking their head. And it's true. I mean, they, it's just normal life there. And it used to be that way here. Every gay bar had a back room. We had sex in the bars. It always happened. It was a little leather shop in the basement of the Gold Coast. And that was the very first leather shop in Chicago, was, I believe, in that basement. And it expanded to something much bigger street level eventually, but it started in the basement of, of, of the Gold Coast. And um, the basement of the Gold Coast felt very dungeony. Uh, so when you went down there, it, felt, it had a kind of sleazy dungeon feel to it. And you immediately went into that space. Sex didn't happen much on the main level. It was a rectangular bar. Men would walk around because gay bars that had that pattern were really welcome because you could keep cruising and cruising. And, cruising. <laughs> and uh, so it had a traffic flow to it that really worked well. Um, so it was, a, it was a magical place. It really was. What are your fetishes? <laughs> <laughs> OK, you said this is an hour. <laughs> um, what are my fetishes? Um, the main thing that trips my trigger when it comes to kink is some aspect of dominance and submission. It could be a little bit, or it could be a lot. But that element trips the trigger and everything that can revive. I can have vanilla sex, but if the dominant sub aspect is in there, it just becomes twisted in my head and it works. Um, so that's kind of the foundation upon which a lot of my fetish kink resides. But uh, bondage, obviously, although I do less of it today than I used to. I used to be kind of known as a rope bondage guy. And now I slap shackles on and clip you up and we're done. You know, it's, it's, it just seemed to have gone there. Um, flogging, single tails, bull whips, um, piss, um, any aspect of fucking, any aspect of, of whole play, ass play, um, piercing, um, clothespins, clips, anything like that, uh, hot wax. I do not like to shave ever because I love hair on men. So I never shave men, I just don't. I've done it once because I really liked the guy. <laughs> um, so I never shave anyway. Um, what are some of my other, uh, it's a long list. The all, I, I, when people ask me, what are you into, I always say, and I mean this, no underage, no non-consensual, pretty much every el everything else is negotiable. Um, there aren't, I mean, I have my things I, I, that go back to over and over, but it's pretty rare I say no to something. And I've gone into some pretty twisted scenes. I, did a, I, I played with a husband and wife once. That was one of the most twisted scenes I've ever done in my life. And I'm, I'm about a Kinsey 5.7. Anybody knows the, so it's like a little smidgen of wiggle room. <laughs> so, but I'm pretty gay. And it was one of the most twisted scenes I'd ever been in was this husband and wife. It was, uh, I still send me a little heart fart. Um, <laughs> Scene. It was a great scene. Um, what made it so great? Well, he was bi. 
And that helped because he was truly by. And I mean, there was no filter. I mean, he was totally by. And she loved, um, he was sub to me, she was dom to him, and she loved seeing him sub to gay men. And, and this is, you know, we're talking the 70s, so this is a very progressive kind of thing. And um, I had played with women in high school, even college, I dated a woman and finally realized this is probably not gonna work. Um, and was an, an avowed bisexual from the age of about 15, because I hadn't placed the gay thing on me yet, because to me, if there was even a smidgen of interest, then I was bi. And I always say, I, I, I don't really like homoflexible and heteroflexible, I don't use it very much, but I just say there's wiggle room and talk to me. Um, but that scene was just magical for, I, for some reason. And I think partly I was very young, um, and they were about 20 years older than me. Oh, wow. Very experienced, very stable, very cool. Um, and they had a dungeon. I had been in some dungeons, but not quite that well equipped. Um, I, learned, I learned later she was a pro dom. I didn't know that. Wow. Um, and I just had this, it was, it was a, we were there a weekend. I, I met them and we spent a weekend in their dungeon. Wow. Yeah. It was pretty cool. And they had another slave that served us the whole time. And I wasn't quite plugged into that whole service thing quite yet. And this guy just kept coming and serving us drinks and serving us things. And, and I finally said, Who is this person that keeps giving us <laughs> And oh, that's my slave. And it turned out to be one of her clients, I believe. But um, yeah, it, was, yeah, it was pretty cool. Well, your religious points of view are fascinating. Please tell us a bit about your thoughts on religion. Ooh. Um, let me preface anything I say as no disrespect to anyone, because I really do respect everyone's choices. I was raised Catholic. That tells you a lot. <laughs> because um, my ex-guy and I used to have a, a theory that Catholicism breeds kinky people. Um, and... Um, so I went to Catholic school, raised Roman Catholic. My dad was in the seminary till two months before his vows. That gives you a sense. He left two months before his vows. My first partner, when I was 17, had just left the Jesuit seminary. So I had this very Catholic influence very, very early on. And to my dad's credit, when I was 13, Sunday, every day until I was 13, he looked at me we were at breakfast, Yet another reason you know why I worship my father. He looked at me and he said, son, you're 13, you're a man. Do you want to keep going to church? And I said, dad, I really don't. He goes, that's your choice. And I never set foot in church again. Thank goodness I had that kind of a father. So, and over time, my religious views evolved. I would identify myself as an agnostic because to me, Again, no disrespect to anybody who identifies a certain way. Atheism, on some level, feels just as arrogant and know-it-all as God-fearing, because we know somehow, and I'm not sure we can. So agnostic feels like that middle ground, and if it seems like I'm equivocating, then so be it, but it seems honest to me that I just don't fucking know. And so I'm agnostic, and I live life by kind of an ethical center that isn't God-based at all. Um, I have no issues with anybody being religious at all as long as they don't try to influence my life based on it. Um, I have many friends that are deeply religious, many friends that are militantly atheist, and um, I kind of walk that middle ground, and I'm okay in that spot. It seems honest to me. Like I said, I, I, every time I, oh, you're an atheist, I said, not really, because, you know, if I meet that person's you know, God, someday, and go, sorry, yeah, I didn't really realize, but we're good. You know, I mean, you live a good life, that's all that matters, and that's what I go by. Well, how did the nonprofit service Kink Aware Professionals come about? Kink Aware Professionals, for those that may not know it, is a, a referral service that refers kinky folk to professionals in the psychotherapeutic, medical, and legal fields. The, and some others too, but that's the main focus. And the original focus, focus was psychotherapeutic. Guy Baldwin, my partner at the time, 
what is a psychotherapist, many people know that, and has a client base that's entirely comprised of kinky people, and always has been. His entire client base is kinky people. And he would keep a little napkin list <laughs> of people he could refer to around the country, and it was this long. A handful of therapists were willing to come out and say, you can openly refer people to me as someone who is kink-friendly. We didn't use that terminology. I made up the kink-friendly term. Um, and he published that little list, I believe, in Dungeon Master, which was a magazine that Desmodus published. It was Tony DeBlaza's magazine. And they published that little, little list. I'm pretty sure that's what it, That or Samatopia Guardian, one of the two. And I said, you know, we need to take this bigger. And so inspired by Guy, who I absolutely was the original brainchild of this referral concept, uh, organizer that I am, I sort of took it by the horns and decided that I would start reaching out to therapists and I started creating this list. People would send a self-addressed staff envelope. This is pre-internet. And they would, I would print it out on my own printer and send them back the list of therapists. And we grew from 10 to 20 to 30. And the last paper-based version that I mailed out, I think had almost 200 therapists on it. Wow. And I, I would literally make calls and say, will you be okay with this? And, and, and then we went net, and it became a website. And then about 10, 12 years into it, I was tired. And it's a lot of maintenance. And I turned it over to the National Coalition for Sexual Freedom. And they maintain this, the website to this day. Um, there, some of us are actually talking about maybe doing a slightly different version of it in a much more robust database, easily searchable form. Um, sorry, NCSF, if this is the first you're hearing about this. Um, but, uh, but we're starting to make overtures about doing something like it again but in a very robust database way, so it's very searchable and very granular to the point where you can say, I'm in this zip code, and it gives you those five therapists within a 10-mile radius or whatever. That, I mean, we need something like that. It needs to be a little bit more granular. So uh, that's the history of, of CAP, K-A-P, Kink Work Professionals. Fantastic. But speaking of Guy Baldwin, you and he worked together to influence the American Psychiatric Association to depathologize kinky sex in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Say that five times fast. <laughs> How did that happen? When you're partnered with a psychotherapist who has a kink population of, for their clientele, um, you talk about this kind of stuff a lot. And so I was very, I'm, I'm not a therapist. People to this day come up to me and say, could I be your client? Because they think I'm a therapist because of my roots with Kat. It happens all the time. Um, and we began to discuss that the DSM was part of the problem. The, the DSM is what codifies pathologies, psychotherapeutic pathologies. And if it's in the DSM, it's sick, for lack of a better way to put it. And their view on BDSM and kink generally was very archaic still is, in my opinion, but it's better. And, well, so I began to do some research. And the research was that this body of people that sits on the DSM um, paraphilia board, which is the sexual disorders board, is this kind of throwback group that's been entrenched for a long time, very old school thinking, the demographic is significantly older. Um, they're very entrenched in their thinking. And what we knew was that we couldn't lobby them directly. So we very quietly never announced this project, but I started to contact therapists all over the country and said, well, do you have any research whatsoever? Do you have case studies? Do you have anything that you can quietly send them with a cover letter saying, please reconsider, please reconsider your diagnostic criteria and the paraphilia section generally. And we had I think at last count, I want to say 225 therapists submitting to that book. And for those that don't know the DSM process, that's, that's an avalanche. People don't take the time to do this. So, and they never announce what they're going to do. They do, oh, now they have drafts that come out, but that didn't happen back then. Now they actually publish a DSM draft and you can kind of look at it and comment on it, but that didn't happen back then. So we waited, we waited, the book came out, and we opened it up, 
and they had changed the diagnostic criteria, which is what we had asked them to do. Previously, by default, if you were into what we're into, you were sick. The new diagnostic criteria said, if you're into this and it negatively impacts your life, you have a problem. Wow. Huge, which is exactly what we wanted. So we succeeded. And it's sin since been taken, the math has been taken up by other people and they um, have taken it even farther. It still needs to go farther. We have brave people like Dr. Charles Mosier and others who are, who are still fighting that fight, but um, it's so much better than it used to be. Fantastic. Well, tell us a little. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Tell us about the, is it uh, Daedalus Publishing Company? Is that the correct pronunciation? Daedalus. Daedalus? Please tell us about it. Daedalus. Um, Daedalus was um, a company I founded. We published nonfiction books about alternative sexuality, primarily BDSM, leather fetish. And it started because I wanted to write a book, a gentle intro kind of book that was reality-based. Reality-based. <laughs> I say that again because a lot of it wasn't in the, in the beginning, the stuff that was written. That was applicable to anyone of any gender, any orientation, that would gently introduce them to BDSM. Which back then I referred to just as SM. I've since changed the name of the book to BDSM. But anyway, um, so I decided to write Learning the Ropes, and in 1992 I published Learning the Ropes. And said, well, you need a publishing company, so I created my own little publishing company, Daedalus Publishing Company, that had one book, mine. <laughs> That's what you did back then as a self-publisher. Today it's very different. We, they accept self-publishers in a way now that they did back then. And then I was with Guy, and I said, Guy, you've written all these essays, Guy Baldwin, you've written all these essays, these should be a book. And so I convinced him to put them all together in a book that's now called Ties That Bind. And I published that. And then I be, uh, there was a Mistress Nan, Nan in, in um, Los Angeles was writing a book. And um, I said, I'll publish that. And um, William, William Henkin and Sybil Holliday wanted to write a book and I said, I'll publish that. And I ended up with a publishing company. And kind of by accident. And then um, uh, Janet Hardy, uh, is, is she here? I don't think she's at this conference. But shortly thereafter, she started Greenery Press. And I believe she started after me. I, I apologize if, she, if it was concurrent, but I think it was a little after I started Daedalus. And we used to collaborate quite a bit because we published different people. And we published with different slants. And we kind of had a collaboration going on. I'm going to publish this, and I'm going to publish that. OK, cool. And at the time, we were the only publishing companies publishing nonfiction books for kids people. And um, then some years ago, I, I sold it. And uh, it is now in other hands. Fantastic. Well, what are your thoughts about the contest circuit? <laughs> Ooh, that's a dicey one. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna. Somebody in this room outed me as a title holder. I love him dearly. He's laughing over here. Um, but I, I, so I'm a title holder. Not, not, most don't know that I, I'm Southern California Master 1992, and my slave at the time was Southern California Slave 1992. Gabrielle was there, I think. Um, so am I supposed to point to people in the audience? I probably shouldn't, but um, she's out. Um, she's, <laughs> and. Um, the reason I buried it for so long, because for, for years nobody knew I was a title holder because I, we, my partner and I buried it. We didn't talk about it at all, intentionally. Because we said, listen, we were in a bar and they talked us into entering the contest five minutes before it started. <laughs> and come on, you, you know, if anyone should be in it, you should blah, 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 et cetera. And we were a fairly well-known master slave couple. He's still my partner to this day, 23 years later. Not my slave, but he's my partner. And um, we said, okay, and there were like six, seven groups of contestants, and we won. And we looked at each other and said, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> this really wasn't our intention. And, and luckily, back then, titles didn't have any obligations whatsoever. 
You've got, pic got your picture taken, people went, oh, you're a title holder, awesome, and then we were done. That was it. And it, that eventually got morphed into International Master Slave, which is what it is today. So Southern California was the precursor to what became international eventually. Um, with that said, so I, um, I am not anti-contest at all. I think we place a preponderance of importance and money and time and effort on them. I think that we make the as mistaken assumption that contests are good ways to pick leaders. Now don't get me wrong, some contests have winners and contestants who are awesome leaders. I contend it has nothing to do with them being a contestant in a contest. You're an awesome leader or you're not. It has zero to do with whether you're a title holder or not. You can come into a title with being a great leader and lead. You can win a title and decide you're gonna let the leader in you come out. I contend the title does virtually nothing for that. That's my stance. I think, and remember, I go back to the very first IML, the very first real leather contest that existed that happened in the Gold Coast bar as a bar contest. It wasn't called IML then, it was Mr. Gold Coast. But it's what became International Mr. Leather, the kind of the grand kahuna of contests. And it was fun. Semi-naked guys in jock straps that were hot that we all wanted to fuck. And oh good, you're Mr. Gold Coast now. Great, you're the guy I want to fuck the most. And that's how you won. <laughs> there were no judges, the audience applauded. <laughs> what do you think? Wow. Okay, you win. The audience picked the people. Wow. Um, it was a very different era. And so that's the contest that I came out of, was it was about a hot guy, gay male in particular at the time, the contest circuit started primarily in the gay male community. And um, you were good looking, could put words together without stumbling, and were a nice guy. That was it. And, and everybody was kinky that was up there to some extent. There was, that was just a given. Um, so I think what's happened is over time it's morphed into this um, hyper fundraising mechanism this um, de facto assumption that we're picking our leaders by having all these contests, I contend we're not. Don't get me wrong, I have a lot of title holder friends and there are many today that are great leaders. But again, I don't think it has anything to do with the contest circuit itself. And I would love to see some of the money and effort and time and resources that goes into contests be consolidated a little more, maybe fewer contests, and put into other projects that I think our scene could do. The other thing is that because it's become this hyper fundraising focus, and Guy Baldwin will be happy I'm mentioning this because it's one of his things, is we raise a shitload of money for everyone else but ourselves. We have raised millions and millions and millions of dollars if you go across all the fundraisers, and the vast majority of time we're doing it for someone outside the scene. Okay, that's nice. But how often have our clubs and organizations and events preached poor? What about saying, okay, what about those 50 people who can't come to this event, we could have scholarships for them if we just raised enough damn money. What if we were able to pay presenters? What if we were to fly presenters in and put them up and treat presenters as true corporate presenters, if you will, because we, this is a corporate model. We have templated the corporate model and adapted it to Kink America, you know, Kink America. And I would love to see the contest circuit raising more money for its own, and I'd probably be a little bit more of a cheerleader for the contest circuit as a result. One more thing. I think that there is an assumption that the contest scene and the leather kink perv scene <laughs> um, are one and the same. I contend they're not. I contend they are two separate ecosystems that intersect. So there are people that literally live in the contest circuit. They go city to city to city, they're at all the contests, they're, they're waving from stages, they're wearing their sashes, whatever it might be, great. That's its own ecosystem, and it's kind of become this self-sustaining ecosystem. And over here, I'm doing a Fenn diagram in the air, and, and over here is the kinky, perv, BDSM, whatever scene. And there's an intersection but it's only an intersection, they don't overlap. So I think when you see it that way, you realize that when, when a lot of kinksters say, you know, the title doesn't represent me, don't say you represent me. 
your title, it's great, awesome, I'll support you, but don't assume that because you won the title that you represent me. Because I can only really point to a handful of title holders ever that I thought truly represented me. So I think that's a good thing to understand, and that way you don't become anti-contest, you know, you don't become pro-contest. You just say contests are what they are, and that's great. The scene is here, they intersect, that's great. But let's approach it from kind of a realistic standpoint and not this Pollyanna, Pollyanna view that the contest circuit necessarily completely mirrors the king scene. I can tell you in the gay men scene, the vast majority of gay men do not feel that title holders represent them at all. There's, it's almost to the point of, they're almost a little angry about it. So, it just don't, you know. Um, but with that said, I think as long as everybody stayed realistic about it, nobody would really get it in. But it's when it's presented as something that it's not that I think people get upset. A question that's formulated in my head uh, goes back a few moments ago to when you alluded to a lot of misrepresentations, misunderstandings of old guard. <laughs> would you visit that a moment more and, and fill that in a little bit? Sure. Um, most of, in this, of us in this room have heard the term old guard. Um, uh, I actually had a, an online spat with um, Andy Mengels, who I believe is the first person to use that term in print. It was in a drummer magazine um, op-ed piece, opinion piece, that I believe Tony Palas had asked him to write. And I had said something on Facebook about, I would like to go back in time and stop the person who used that term from using the term, because I think it's been so misappropriated and uh, mythologized that it doesn't resemble anything like what it was supposed to. And he got he took offense, and Andy and I are friends, and we, we, we're okay. But the reason is that when you hear the term old guard, and I'm often supposed to be part of that, that's what's really weird. They, they name me as part of this group, right? I said, that's not what it looked like at all. Was there a tiny little subset of people that followed really rigid protocols and that, that had leather families, as we talk about them, and had ceremonial things happen? Um, yeah, there was a tiny little subset where they all codified into some sort of templated version of each other? No, they all grew up independently. And we're, remember, no, no internet back then. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about a scene where on the, on the west coast, he's on the left meant top, but on the east coast, he's on the left meant bottom. They, we didn't, couldn't even get our signals straight. <laughs> so um, that codification is a lot of mythology. And, but there's always a smidgen of truth to all mythology. And so that smidgen has been expanded and morphed into something that doesn't really resemble reality. And I'm not quite sure why, but it, I mean, maybe we like our stories and we like to mythologize and enhance and our stories. Um, so when somebody says, I'm old guard, and I just look at them and say, well, what does that mean? And then you ask 10 people and it means 10 different things to 10 people. And so, I don't use the term myself except to reference it. I don't like people that co-opt it as I'm old guard. No, you're you, and be you, and fuck what people did 40 years ago. That's really not that important. Don't disrespect them, but don't base your life on them. And that's the part that annoys me, is when people build their lives on the past, and it's like, I mean, truthfully, if we were old guard, Gay men, leave the room because you wouldn't be with any women here. If we were really old guard, you know, um, heterosexuals, gays, lesbians, bi, in-betweens, whatever, you would not all be mixing right now. Old guard didn't mix back then. So we're not old guard now. Nobody's old guard now. We're a very different scene now. And I, I respect individuality and I really believe people need to be themselves. It doesn't mean you disrespect the past. It's no disrespect to history. None. They were trailblazers. Let's be trailblazers now and not try to worship at the altar of what they did, because they want you to move on. They wouldn't want you to live back then. What's the biggest misconception about you? Mm. 
that I live in a dungeon with hot and cold running slaves. <laughs> um, um, it's funny, I, we were at a big event um, in San Francisco, Lebanon's discussion group, and Brian Dawson was talking about the first time he met me, which, um, unfortunately, he's told the story so many times that people think that's my life. So, he walked into my house, and I had a throne in the house. I did have a throne, I really did. And, and I had a slave on this side, and, and one of them was Guy Baldwin. And I had a slave on this side, named Wes Lockwood, and to, to this day, two of the most amazing men on the face of the earth. And that's how Brian met me. And that's the assumption many people have, is that's how I live my life. Oh, if only. <laughs> that was a little slice of my life at that time. I was very, I was living kind of a 24-7 BDSM kink life back then. I still am, but not in the same way. So that's the biggest misconception, is that I live this incredibly entrenched 24-7 playing, you know, I, I, I'm going to whip you here and I've got to move over to this room to whip this one. And I mean, that just doesn't, it's just not my life. I, I work in corporate America. I work for a very large corporation, I'm a director, so I'm pretty high up, openly kinky, out. Um, I'm out as a gay, I mean, I I'm not gonna name the company, but they're very cool, and it's a big company. Um, and so I live in a world that I just have to function on a daily basis, just like everyone else does, so that's probably the biggest misconception about me. Ray Stannon, I would like to thank you for your contribution to the uh, fireside chats. Thank you very much.